Training for Success. Welcome to the second in our series of our webinar. So the, the first one we had was on the key skills for high performance. So welcome back to those who took part in that first one and welcome to those that are new and for the first time. What we're gonna be talking about and focusing on tonight um, is the area of training for success. So we're gonna spend about an hour and a half and we're gonna to try to focus in particular on training and various drills and how we can make training as beneficial as possible to be successful when it comes to the actual match. Other webinars after this, we're, we're still gonna try to do a few more and we're gonna try to concentrate on some defensive structures and tactics some goal scoring and attacking structures and more. Before we start, just make sure you've, you've got your audio muted. And if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself and just ask it any time. So the first thing is, my name's Steve Willer and I'm the, the current Australian men's indoor hockey head coach. I've been in that role since early 2016 and I'll be taking you through the training for success today. In terms of our webinar, it's broken up into a few different areas. So we're gonna go through a little bit of an introduction. We're gonna talk about something called, or a concept called deliberate practice. We're going to look into some training activities and some methods for progressing them and designing them and designing further training activities and games and then just some various tips and we'll follow that up with any questions that, that you might have that you haven't asked during at the very end as well. The first thing is I just want to look at a very quick quote. So this is from an article called Not All Practice Makes Perfect by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole, who've done a lot of research into high performance and peak performance and how practice plays a part. So their quote basically is, effective practice is deliberate, conscious, focused, and the single most important factor in determining a person's ultimate achievement. I want you to try to keep that in mind as we go through the whole presentation here, because it's a, it's a very important concept and particularly in the form of deliberate practice, how I'm going to sort of propose that you can structure training drills and sessions. Now, from my point of view, when I run training sessions, I have a couple of very simple goals for every training session that I plan and I conduct. One of the main goals I have is about improvement. And I aim to ensure that every time a player steps off the court at the end of a training session with me, that they are better than when they stepped on the court at the training session start. So I don't want to have a player basically being the same standard stepping off as they were when they stepped on. The second is I like to encourage all my players to focus on two key points when they think about their training and when they train. The first is for them to always be training at a match intensity. So trying to do everything at that intensity that would be required during a match. The second is for them to concentrate on reproducing the skill that we're working on so it can be consistently executed in a match and under pressure situations. Now, earlier we showed that little quote and I mentioned um, Ericsson and Poole. Their article, Not All Practice Makes Perfect, moving from naive to purposeful practice can dramatically increase performance, was put out in 2016. And it came by a lot of research that the two of the men had done um, over many, many years. From their research, there was a couple of key things that came out. Basically, they believe that work ethic is the most important indicator for success. So we've all known young players with enormous amounts of talent and they don't make it to the elite level. So for some reason, all of this talent that they've got and they don't make it to that next level where we expect them to. Yet a teammate with less talent, but a higher level of determination and work ethic eventually surpasses them. And Poole and Ericsson believe that for training to be successful, it needs to be challenging and extend the participant. 
they believe we need to provide feedback through multiple channels. So it might be verbal, it might be as a group, it might be individually, and feedback also from their ability as a player to have success and failure, to make mistakes, from the results they have, from video, etc. So lots of different methods, not just one method of feedback. Training needs to provide the opportunity for the participant to repeat the required skill or concept multiple times. So opportunities to repeat enough to learn from previous efforts, to try new variations, to gain enough feedback and make the skill or concept hardwired, automatic and second nature. So it can be formed under pressure consistently at a high level. And this is a, this is a big one, the ability to allow the player to have that repetition, to be able to work on it and to be able to get the feedback they need as they do it. Now they outlined five keys to truly effective training from their article in 2016. And number one was they said it had to be highly structured. So what they mean by highly structured was it had to be planned out. It had to have a purpose and you had to be able to see how it would progress. It had to be specific and relevant. So it really had to target exactly what it was that needed to be improved and it had to be relevant to performance. So not just improving an area that wouldn't have an actual effect later down the track in that match or that game. The third one was that weaknesses are targeted and performance is monitored. So physically working hard to identify what the weak areas are and then actually targeting them with repetition and with drills and with training to improve them. Number four, mentally and physically focused. So making sure that the participant has got their mental focus on what they're doing and they're physically focused. So we're not doing things where they don't have to think and they're just doing them automatically. If they're doing them automatically, they're not focusing on them and therefore there's no improvement happening because it's just automatic. And the last thing is this concept of rewardless. So as we become more and more elite as a player, the training that we do becomes more rewardless. So the reward is going to be the match performance at the end, the personal best, the, the gold medal, the win, not necessarily receiving a, war, a reward directly there at training. Now this whole concept is basically called deliberate practice. There was a book that the, the two gentlemen, Erickson and Poole wrote, um, and if you're interested in learning more about their research and about deliberate practice, I reckon, really recommend having a look at the book. It's called Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise, and it's an excellent read, but it's definitely worth having a look at and looking more into this concept of deliberate practice when you're looking into designing your training sessions and how you run them. So before we get more into detail in the process that I often use to develop um, success through training, we're gonna have a look at just a couple of simple drills to start with. And these drills can be used as quick warm up drills or to break up training. Um, and they can just be thrown in anywhere. So the first drill is just a flow passing drill. And the drill involves two lines of players. I find the best number of four to six players per setup. Any more than that, there's too much standing around. Players have the opportunity to lose focus, not be able to concentrate mentally. So here's just first example of a possibility of a drill, a flow passing drill, passing on the move, receiving on the move, not having much time to, you know, stand and watch, but it's also a little bit more active than the standing and passing in pairs. The second drill is a variation on this one. And it's essentially the same where we're doing a flow drill where we have roughly two to um, two plays each side and they're running and passing. However, this time we've now incorporated the use of the board. Now, what I want you to notice as well with this is it's really important with the use of the boards here that you'll notice sometimes when the ball hits the boards, it bounces off a bit erratically, a bit different, sharper or shallower. So what it means is this also gets our players mentally having a focus on the ball because they're not exactly sure where it's gonna bounce. As we know, the consistency of boards really makes it harder to trap off them. So this allows our players to keep their mental focus as well.
But again, those two drills are just very quick, simple drills that you can do for about 40 to 60 seconds. Only have to go for about a minute. You don't have to go for much longer and you can just randomly throw them in. They can be part of a warm up or part of a bit where you want to give some players a bit of a break from a bigger drill. The next real quick drill we'll talk about before we get into the whole process again is this one is a one touch passing drill. So what's going to happen is the players on the halfway line will start with passing the ball. Then as a pair, they'll move down the court, passing with one touches where the passes try to be going forwards. Once they get into the circle, then they're trying to have a one touch shot. Some players find this difficult because of the one touch concept and they often want to, to trap it. So just some quick one touches, whether it's on the four stick, the back stick, whether their body's in the right position, we want them just trying to get those little one touches going, keeps them moving, keeps them thinking. And again, it's a, it's a nice little drill that can be done quickly. It doesn't have to be done for long, but keeps the players moving and keeps their one touch going with their mental focus. Okay, another a quick one is just a one-on-one -on -one drill where the attacker and the defender start near the top of the circle, the ball's passed to the attacker with their back to the defender, and it's essentially a one-on-one -on -one elimination. Next one is a slight variation on it. So rather than having the defender and the attacker staying at the top of the circle, they both start near the halfway line. The defender runs the ball a couple of steps forwards, then they do a little dump pass and the attacker picks it up and it's straight away one-on-one -on -one initiated where they're on the move and they're only a meter or two apart from each other. So the defender's in the orange, the attacker's in the blue trying to encourage quick elimination rather than a long exaggerated time to eliminate. Now, one variation on that one is you can add a second attacker up on the halfway line as well. So it ends up becoming a two on one, or you could flip it and you could actually have a second defender up on the halfway line and it becomes one attacker versus two defenders. All right, so they were just a couple of really quick drills, just that you can use at any time during training at the start for warming up to mix it up, but they just add a couple of little things going on. Now I wanna talk about the process that I generally use when I'm trying to develop a concept and some skills and trying to then have them transferred so that we can successfully perform them in matches and they can make a difference to our game. So my process basically is the first thing with a drill is I give them a chance to understand the activity. So in most cases, when we set up a particular drill or a particular activity, it should have a bit of complexity to it. And it will take the players a number of turns for them to get accustomed to how it works. Where does the ball go? Where do I need to move? If the players can understand the drill straight away and there's no issues, then the drill's probably too simple and doesn't require any thinking from them. So we want to encourage that thinking from our players. We want to encourage the players to have to think about what they're doing. We want to encourage the players to talk amongst themselves to make sure that each person's getting to the right position or doing the right sort of pass or run. The second thing is, with that chance to understand the activity, we're not expecting perfection. That's why we're training. We train to get better. So we shouldn't be expecting it to be done perfectly. Once they get an understanding of how the drill actually works, the second thing is then I try to focus on some key points for that activity or drill. So for example, exactly the angle a pass needs to go or how quickly a pass needs to go 
or where the ball needs to be received or where a player needs to position themselves. So once they've got a basic understanding of the drill, then I start to focus on key points to make the actual drill very effective for what we want it to be later. The third step is I add key skills. So when I talk about key skills, a key skill might be a, a one touch pass or a shot. It might be a spin or a turn. It might be a back drag or it might be an arc. So what I do is I try to add a key skill or two into every drill so that not only while they're practicing the main drill, they're also having the ability to practice another skill at the same time. I often try to put that key skill at the very start of the drill. So therefore, if they stuff it up, if they make a mistake, if they have to restart, we're not restarting into the drill every time. It's just the start of the drill restarts. The fourth thing then is I move into adding variations, but I provide situational reasons for them. So here's a variation and this is why we would do it. So there is a greater understanding of how things are working. The next thing I move on to is I encourage players to make decisions and read the cues. So we provide them, here's all these variations you've had. Now you need to start to make a decision. What are you going to do at this point? Which variation are you going to do? What choice are you going to make? And then the other players have to read the, the cues to then position themselves based on what they believe is going to happen. Step six is then I start adding defenders as the outside factor. So they affect the decision-making. So the position of a defender may then make a player make a particular choice or decision. And then that's what's making the decision rather than the player being able to make any decision they want. Now, with the defenders, when I include them, I also try to have my defenders that when they're there in the drill, that what they actually wanna do as a defender is try to encourage the player with the ball to make the option that the defender wants. So rather than just trying to stop them, try to make them pass the ball where they want or try to make them run the ball where they want. So the defender getting used to controlling the situation rather than just trying to stop it. The last thing is then just adding additional players and continually progressing it until it gets to that match play five on five situation. And then what we've been trying to work on then gets encompasses within an actual game. So let's now look at that process as an example, going through a common match situation. So one of the common patterns of play that we notice is that a large number of goals are scored in indoor hockey through a few common patterns of play. And a common pattern of play is one going down the left-hand side of the court. In fact, the pattern of play I'm gonna show you, approximately 25% of all the field goals are scored by something very similar to this sort of movement. Here's two examples, an example from the 2019 Euro Hockey Men's Indoor Championships. So the red team, Belgium against Netherlands in the gray, passing the ball into that left corner and then moving the ball out of the left hand corner to score a goal. Watch another example of a similar sort of movement and pattern of play. So the white team is Germany, red team is Belgium. Similar movement down the left-hand side, creating a goal scoring opportunity. So we've identified this is something that we believe we need to be able to perform and do successfully at a level if we want to win games. And we also understand there's going to have to be variations to it and changes to it. So let's now go through the process and try to develop a way of turning a successful team performance and creating goals scored through the training process to get to that. So we're gonna look at a left side attacking drill. What we'll do is we'll look at the whiteboard to start with. So we'll explain it on the whiteboard. So you should be able to see a little whiteboard there. The first thing is the drill we're gonna be doing is attacking down the left-hand side. So we're gonna look at attacking down this side of the court. We're gonna start with a player near the halfway with the balls, a player in the middle and a player in the corner. So that's gonna be our basic setup that we're then gonna move through this entire process with. So we're gonna progress from this and continually start to add options and variations and players. 
So the way it works is the ball starts with player number one, they pass it off the boards around player number two down to the player in the corner. Then what happens is player number two, as soon as it goes past them, they run over into the circle, sort of in line with the penalty spot and the far post. And player number one moves forwards to take that now gap where player two is left. The ball comes out of the corner, back to player one. And then player one starts to move with the ball towards the middle and they pass over to player two and they follow their pass across and get to the edge of the circle. Player two then gives a one touch or a quick pass back to that player and our player on the back line has moved in. So we've now got three players and when the player gets the ball back on top of the circle up here, so this original player who started with it, they can do whatever they like. So they can shoot, they can pass down to the person on the back line and they can put it in. They can pass it back to the person on the right side and they can shoot and score. But the basic pattern is it goes into the corner, comes back out of the corner, goes into the circle, and then we move from there. So to make it make more sense, let's now have a look at how we progress it using some, some videos. Just uh, bring back up the presentation. All right, so we should be back now to the, the slides. So here's an example of what it looks like in the process. You can see we've got our three players there and the ball's starting on the halfway line. So the ball gets passed from the halfway line down to the corner, comes back out goes into the circle, comes back, and then from that point, it could be anyone shooting from that point. So I'll play it again. Oops, I'll go back one. We'll play that again. So again, this is what it looks like. It forces our players to have to think about what's going on. They have to then move after they've done something. So it keeps them actually having a thinking rather than just sitting there and just going through a flow or a process. Here's another look at it from a different angle. So again, you can see the three players over on the boards. Ball goes in the corner, comes out, goes back into the circle, and then we work out whether we're shooting. Down to the corner, back up. So players have to move and do multiple things. It also keeps our goalkeeper's footwork and keeps them moving. All right, so the next step then is we've got our players used to the way that the drill works. So as the drill works, players now understand the pattern and we start to focus on some key points to make the drill effective in a real match situation and improve the quality of the drill. For example, we don't want our players too far away from the boards when they're passing from the halfway line to the corner, because if they're too far away from the boards and the person on the back line's receiving it four or five meters in the court, they're gonna be getting intercepted by defenders or they're gonna find themselves under pressure by defenders. So we wanna make sure our, our players are close to the boards. Another thing we might want is to make sure that the player receiving the ball in the corner is able to receive it on their four stick and then not having to receive it on their reverse stick because that's going to slow the process down. We want to make sure if we can that the player in the corner um, thinks about his positioning to get the ball back as quick as possible too so he's not holding on to it too long. The player who's inside the circle at the top who receives it thinking about giving a one touch pass back rather than a trap. So little things like that, we work on improving the quality of. The third step, which we mentioned was adding a key skill. So one of the things here we've added is you'll notice that the player on the halfway line now is facing their back to the players. That's because what we've decided to add here is a spin. So the player on the halfway line before they even start the drill is always going to try to practice doing a spin and then start the drill. So that way we're gonna practice a spin every time we do this drill. And if it does stuff up, the drill hasn't commenced. So it's quite easy to grab another ball and do it again. So we'll have a bit of a look at it. So he does the spin and then it's the same drill as we had at the start, but trying to just improve a few little things from them. Now, 
these examples here with the, the guys on this court, there's no goalie, but that's just because there wasn't a goalie at this session. So you can notice there with that last one, for example, it wasn't that we said to the players, I now want you to pass the ball from when you get it back near the edge of the circle, I now want you to not shoot. It was always the option that when this player got the back near the edge, they could do whatever they wanted. They could pass it or shoot. So here they've just made their decision by themselves and they've then created that passing option. Here's another a view of it. Same thing down the left. We started with a spin, do the pass down and we start to get the movements going, trying to get a bit more quality within the drill and incorporating that spin at the start. So you can start to see a few more one touches, a bit more passing in the circle at times. And every player involved in the drill, you can see them mentally having to think about what they're doing, not just having to stand there. So then the next step we spoke about is adding variations with situational reasons. So in this drill, we've now added some patterns of play variations. The first variation we added here is that the ball is going to go back to the baseline player and then be passed across the face of the goal for a tap in. So similar to the goals that we saw scored in those two example clips at the very start um, from the Euro Championships, we're going to see that ball move across the back line. So we've added our first variation. We've still got the spin, still the ball into the corner and back, but this time goes to the back line and then across the face for that tapping. So we practice this for a number of occasions before we add another variation. So if we have a look, here's another example of it. And when we explain to the players about the pass going back to the baseline player, this is where we also take that opportunity to provide situational um, awareness. So we explain to them that the reason why when the ball goes straight into the corner, they can't pass it across the back line is because there's no player there yet. And we have to give them time to get there to make that tap in. So by the ball coming back out of the corner and then going back in a second time, that's now allowed time for our player to get in position in front of the goals to make that tap in. So we just add little bits like that as we go to try to add reasons to them so they understand why a particular choice is being made. So it goes back, which gives time, and then the ball goes across. Again, we have the spin at the start, pass off the boards, back out, back to the back line, and then across the face. All right. Now we continue to add variations. So here's some more examples of some variations. And what I'll do is after we've watched it, I'll go back and I'll, I'll mention about the situational reasons I would give to the players for each of these things happening. But we keep letting them um, go through different variations a number of times so they can repeat them. And that way they start to develop all the different ideas that can happen and they start thinking more about what's possible. So here we had a short pass around the long pass and then the ball went to the corner. So it was like a relay pass. The guy in the middle gets it. And then he's passing. So the first one where he spun around and did on the four stick, the second one he did on his back stick. Long pass again. This time the player in the corner's run out and there's been a little overlap. And then the players put the ball across. So if we have a, a bit of a look at, we'll go back to them. If we have a bit of a look at some of them now, what we try to explain here is we say, the reason why we wanna give a short pass here is for some reason, the long pass isn't on. So there's a defender behind our middle player who's got the ball and we can't make a long pass because it's gonna get intercepted. So because of that, the player with the first ball gives a shorter pass so the pass doesn't get intercepted. And then it's up to the middle player then to get the ball into the corner. In this situation, he does a little roll to his right, which means he's got past him and he's able to now give that pass into the corner. Now this next variation, when he's given the short pass, the middle player, as he starts to move in court, the defender's moved in court. So he can't give a pass in court and he can't roll in court with the ball. So what he does instead is because the defender's overcommitted and gone too far in court, He's opened up the boards. So now he uses a reverse stick to go down the gap he's opened. So explain if the defender moves too far in, we can give a back stick pass down the boards. 
This one here, we've given a long pass. So we've said we can make the long pass. We don't need the relay. But what we've said is something's gone wrong here in the corner and the player with the ball in the corner isn't able to give a pass. They're under a bit of pressure. So instead they've chosen to run the ball forwards. Maybe a goalkeeper's come out at them. Maybe a defender started chasing them. So they run the ball forwards to allow themselves to get some room. As they then have dragged the goalie or the player towards the top of the circle, that creates space further near the back line and our other player can overlap and then they can give that pass across the face. So that's some examples of what we would sort of say to players about why this particular option might be good or what sort of situation it would be um, effective in, we'll say. All right. Now, we're going to, again, watch um, some more examples here. So again, this is um, a different group of players and a different angle, but have a look and see them again. So we've got a wrap around there and then out, we've come back. He's come across this time, so he didn't go to the corner. And then they've had the shot. He's done his spin. So we're practicing, it's a short pass. He's given it back this time because that was the option which was available. And then we've gone across the face. So you can see how all these little variations now and these options are starting to be made. At the moment, the players are basing them on whatever they choose and whatever they want. So there's nothing such as an outside factor telling them what is available, what isn't available. But the key I'm hoping is you can see, we haven't gone too far in this drill yet. Now suddenly we're starting to see a lot of different variety and variations in ball movements and player movements. Now, one of the things about this is at various stages during the drill as well. So I'll come back to it again so I can play it. At various stages during this drill as well, we might say, for example, to the player who starts on the halfway line, from now on, you can either make a short pass or a long pass. That's up to you. Whatever you want to do each time, but you make the decision. Now, if they make a long pass, that tells the middle player that they now have to move in court in towards the circle because there's no point staying there um, on the boards because that's where the player from the halfway line wants to run. So we're getting players to start reading cues. If the player on the halfway gives a short pass, that tells everyone to sort of stay where they are because we may be having the ball going in the corner or it may be coming back out. So the player on the halfway line is gonna make a choice of which type of pass he's gonna give. Then the player in the middle is gonna make a choice. Are they gonna give a back stick pass? Are they gonna give a spin with a pass into the corner? Are they gonna give the ball back to the player on the halfway line? But they're gonna make a choice again of what they wanna do. If the ball goes into the corner like it has now, it's now up to the player in the corner to make a decision about whether they're going to pass it back out, whether they're going to hold on to the ball and run the ball out. And then if the ball comes back out with a pass, it's going to be up to the player who's now got the ball. Will they pass it into the circle or they pass it to the back line? So what's happening is we're creating this situation where every player is now having to make decisions about what they want to do and the other players are having to read these cues so they know where to move so we're keeping that high mental focus going and we're trying to create that ability to make decisions read cues and be creative and the players get to decide these things about what they're doing without any pressure of having defenders however the next step is now to incorporate this defender so we want to have an outside factor which is going to affect each player's decision-making. So the drill is effectively now turned into a three-on-one where the three attacking players need to make their decisions based on the defender and the options that are available. So here you can see the defender is standing in court side of the middle player. So that means that our player to the halfway can give the long pass. If they were to go stand in the boards, then that would mean that we would give a short pass. So it's already impacting on the decision-making of the player who starts with the ball. Notice we're still starting with the spin at the start. So again, we're still practicing that main key skill at the beginning. Now let's watch um, a few of these examples and we can see how the players now have to recognize situations and decide what they're going to do.
So the players there, you could see there was a few little mistakes. Things took a bit of time because the defenders now forcing them to have to think about what to do, read the situation and make a decision. So as they do more and more of it, they get faster at it. Now, something I want to mention here, which I sort of touched on at the start, but I'd like to mention again, is a key when using a defender, especially in this situation where they are completely outnumbered, is about getting the defender to understand what their role is. So their role isn't to stop the drill, but their role is to try to defend in a way that they encourage the attackers to use the option they want them to. So if a defender can sit there and say, well, I want them to do the long pass and they position themselves so that long pass happens, then they've controlled that situation. If they say, I don't want them to do the long pass, I want them to do a short pass, and then they position themselves and they have to give a short pass, again, they've now controlled the situation. If the defender says, I want them to have to make that pass along the back line to score the goal, and then they start to position themselves throughout the drill to encourage the pass into the corner and encourage only the pass along the back line, and that happens, the defender is actually one. So it's not about the defender getting possession of the ball. It's not about the defender stopping the drill, especially in the situations where they're completely outnumbered. It's about them trying to control the ball movement and the outcome and them getting used to that controlling ability when they do defend. Here's a, another clip just showing a three on one. So we've got the spin. Again, defenders trying to move, balls are moving. And you notice there that everything was just a little bit quicker. Players are getting better used to making decisions, identifying what's going on. And we're starting to see variety in what players are doing. And these clips here are showing majority of things which are working, but there are clips where they don't work. And that's the feedback the players get. So they might do the back stick pass down the boards and it gets intercepted. And then they turn around and go, oh, I shouldn't have given that because the defender wasn't inside me. They were out near the boards. So even when they stuff up, it's the feedback they then get from that and understanding what the choices they should have made. Here's some more examples. So we've got the three on one now with the defender and the defender trying to encourage them to go somewhere. The attackers having to make decisions based on the defender's positioning. Now, I'm actually going to pause there because I want to go back to one of the points we were talking about at the start before we look at a couple more. At the start, I spoke about feedback. And sometimes we'll notice during training sessions, what happens is the whole drill gets stopped or everyone gets stopped and, and feedback just happens as one big group. Or we wait until the end of a drill. One of the things I like to do is that when I see something happening in a drill, I like to actually talk to the player straight after it and talk about what choice they've made, what other choices there were or ways that it could be improved or even ask why they made a particular decision. So here you can see me just coming up to the player, having a quick little chat. It only takes about 10, 15 seconds at the very most. The drill hasn't stopped, players are still going and they're able to get back into the drill again. Sometimes coaches get a little bit too focused and they want to control everything and they want to make sure that they can see everything that's going on in a particular drill and they don't want to miss anything. But it's really important to be able to offer that, that feedback constantly throughout the drills and the training as things happen. All right, so the next step is then what we talked about with adding those additional players. So here, what we've done is we're progressing towards that match play. We're trying to get towards that five V five. Here's an example of the drill now progressed to a four versus two. So we're adding an extra attacker 
and an extra defender. And all we've done is we've basically set it up and said, this is where the extra attacker will stand. And this is where the extra defender will stand. So we'll go into the whiteboard just to show how it's now set up. There we go. So originally we both had our player on the boards, player in the middle, player in the corner, and we added a defender in here. Now what we've done is we've added another attacker in the middle here, and we've added a defender over here in this middle area as well. But rather than telling the defender exactly where they have to stand, what we've said to them is they can stand in that area, but if they don't stand close to this middle player, or if they get a little bit too far over here and they open this pass up, then our player at the middle might just pass straight away to the guy on top and he might run in and score. So what it does is it then encourages the second defender to have to think about their positioning because we don't want that pass happening to begin with because that's too dangerous to go straight in. It also makes the defending in the boards have to think about, well, wait a second, if I'm too close to the boards, maybe I'm gonna encourage them to come inside. So maybe I should actually stand inside because then at least I'm going to encourage the ball to go a little bit wider, which means we can keep it out wider and make the shot more difficult later. So that's basically the setup of this, this four on two now. Now, one of the things about the four on two when I generally set it up is I will set it up so that the players aren't told too much. So what it will simply be is it will be like, all right, we're going to now add an extra defender. We're now going to add an extra attacker. And what's going to happen is they'll stand here and now you can use them. And then we just get them to try and do it. So here's an example of this four on two now where we've got the players. And we basically have the similar sort of movements and similar sort of positioning. And we talk about getting people in the same sort of spots so that we're trying to score these goals. And we see what sort of little variations or changes or creativity they can come up with to get a particular shot away or a particular pass away or create a gap with a little rotation or changing. So now we've made it a lot more fluid and a lot more decision-making happening. What I'll tend to do is once, I'll come back to it so we can view it again. What I'll tend to do is once we are in this method and we've done a few of these, I might stop the drill really quickly with the group. And I might sort of say, hey, and I might go stand on top of the circle and say, for example, where we've got our defender and our attacker, I'll say, what about these couple of quick options? So I might, for example, get the um, player to pass me the ball on top of the circle and I might do a quick little spin and have a shot. I might do a reverse stick and have a shot. I might run an arc and then look at passing the ball backwards. But I show them a few quick variations, which might only be, you know, four or five second demo for each. I might show them, I'll stand inside the circle a few steps and I can do a deflection. So we show them a few things and then we do the drill and we see if they can try to do them. If I want to make that more effective, what I can then do is I can actually then stop the drill and do another drill for another five or six minutes. So what I mean by that is let's go back to our whiteboard again. So we've got this, this pattern of play we've set up where we've got this four on two. And what we do now is we just say, all right, we're actually only going to start with a player here with the balls and we're only going to start with a player here. So we're going to ignore everything else. And now all we're going to do is pass the ball to the guy on the top. And then that guy on the top is going to practice doing a spin and a release shot. Or they're going to practice doing a spin, stop the ball and a wrist shot. Or they're going to practice doing a trap, an arc, and then slip a square ball in for the other player to come in and shoot. Or we might say practice that they stand a step inside the circle now and the ball goes through and they try to do a deflection. So we might do a bit of practice on that for five or six minutes where we just do it really simple with no other factors. And then we go straight back into the four on two again and we see if they can now implement that after they've had a chance to do a little bit of repetition. So let's bring our show back up. So just have a, a little bit of a, a look 
that. We'll go back, we'll look at it one more time. And just notice how you can see all the opportunities to add a few extra skills in, a few variations, and then players can turn this four on two into a very, very fluid sort of gameplay, making a lot of decisions and getting feedback instantly about whether something works or doesn't work. And from here, we could add another attacker, we could add another defender, and we could keep building it till we get to the five on five. And we've now been able to develop that whole left side concept and have players making decisions and having to have a real large amount of variety every time that something happens. So that's, that's an example of going through the process. What I wanna do now is look at it again in terms of the process, but Let's have a little bit of a look at going via um, a different concept. So we just looked at going down the left-hand side, for example. So let's look at a common play, which again scores a lot of goals and a movement down the right-hand side. Now this accounts for around 30% of field goals, similar sort of patterns to this um, account for about 30%. And again, here's a couple of clips from the 29 Euro hockey. Um, so you can see what we're talking about in action. So we've identified these tactically as something that we believe that we can work on. And here's another example. So again, this right-hand attacking concept. All right, so now we're going to take that concept that's very effective at the elite level and we're going to try to develop a way of our players being able to fluidly make decisions attacking down that right hand side that are going to be effective, they're going to be successful and going to give us opportunities to then win games. So similar to last time, we'll, we'll start by having a look at what it's going to look at, um, like on the whiteboard to set it up. So this time we're going to be going down the right hand side of the court and we're going to try to get this pattern of play to resemble that key match concept and the elements of it. So the way we're going to set it up is again we're going to have a player starting near the halfway line with the balls and we'll have a player this time starting near the edge of the circle in court a little bit. All will happen is the ball will be passed that play near the top of the circle. They're gonna run a nice little arc towards the back line, bounce off the back line. And then they're gonna look for that little 45 degree pass back in line with the near post. The player picking up that pass will be the same player who passed it from the halfway line. They'll run down, pick it up and then make the shot. So that's how we're going to start basically set up of it to get players used to what we want and how we're going to start by introducing the the main concept ideas that are very critical for it working so we'll go back to our videos of it all right now here it is um, with a video so again this one doesn't have a goalie but you'd have a goalkeeper there if you want and we're just gonna focus on the basic idea of it. So again, the players do it and we're not so interested in about how well they do it. It's just about them getting the idea of how the drill works. And then after that, then we're gonna to start to focus on the key parts of it. So the ball gets passed to the player, they run that arc, passes it back, and then we have that nice little one touch shot. Now, once the players understand the drill and they know how it's gonna work, again, we focus on key elements of the drill to improve the quality of it, to make sure it's effective in real match situations. 
Now, for it to be effective in match situations, there's a few little important things. So for example, the person taking the shot needs to be on that near post, not in the middle of the goal or not behind where a defender could intercept. So we need them to be on the near post. So we talk about their positioning. We talk about the person running the ball along the back line to make sure that they, as I term it, bounce off the back line. So they don't run along the back line and they don't run over the back line, but they take a step off the back line, which then allows them options later. But it also means they tend to look at where they're passing so they can see where the gaps are. Then um, we move into adding a number of variations that we might use. So similar to what we were doing previously. So here we go, we have that movement. And again, it's the ball back and then that quick little one touch shot. Ball goes in, runs that arc, bounces off the back line, pass back, one touch again. So we're starting to get a bit better at it. We're focusing on those things. Now I'm gonna go back to that one because there was a slight little difference there, which we've added in. So this is one of those little things we, we talked about with them to make that next step. So once they trapped it, we now wanted them to do a little drag inside, a little step inside with the ball to encourage the defender to step inside the court and create a bit of space outside and then to move out. So we started to get them to practice that movement because if the defender didn't move in court, then they could simply then go onto their back stick in the circle and get straight in without having to run the back line. But we want to encourage the space to be created out and then we move. So we added that little bit there, that little key skill, ball comes back to one touch. So we've got that little dummy in, running out. Now that one we had a drop back pass or a dump pass. So this time we've got the variation where we've got them with their back stick to dump the ball 90 back. And we spoke earlier about giving reasonings why. So with this little dump back pass, what we've said is the player, as they do this arcing movement to the back line, they haven't been able to get around the defender. So they haven't been able to get around them and get into that space behind them to give that little 45 ball back. So the defender's staying with them. So because the defender's staying with them, we can't get the ball inside. So then they have to identify of giving a little dump back ball and the player running in from behind has to identify that, well, the cues are the ball's not coming inside. So I'm gonna stay outside for that little dump ball. So we've got a little variation now added. Little inside again, tries to make space. Little dump ball, the quick one touch shot. Now, notice we've started to get the player who's running the back line as well, looking for the ball to come back. So you can see here as they move, they've got their stick down, they're looking for a little deflection in as well. So it's not just the pass, but it's also looking for that next phase of getting the ball back again. So trying to keep them involved within the play. Dummy in, run out. This time we've done a double arc. So we've explained to them when the player near the top of the circle picks the ball up, that maybe when they pick the ball up, that they aren't able to have a quick shot for some reason. So because they can't have the quick shot here at this point, or the ball's not in the right position, that it might be better for them then to continue a second arc. And then the other player then becomes that little 45 uh, pass for the quick shot. So again, we put another situation in there that they have to start thinking about why they would do something different. There it is again. And just in here, just one of the key technical things which I try to encourage my players, the player on the back line with the ball now, after he passes it, notice how he turns to keep his eye on the ball. And as he gets to that position then to make the one touch shot in, he hasn't taken his eyes off the ball. So one thing I try to encourage my players to do is to not turn their back on the ball. So by turning to face the ball at all times, they can then see what's happening and they can always be ready. So sometimes players will turn their back on the ball and that just makes things much more difficult later on. So here we've given a little square ball in. So he hasn't been able to run around the player, the defender's too good. So this time he gives a little square ball inside as he's opened up. Here they started on the boards. 
Now they've started on the boards because they couldn't receive the pass in court. So because they couldn't receive the ball in here where they were before, and now they can only receive the ball wide, now we've shown them a variation of how to receive it wide, but still create space to then make this arc movement. So here you'll see them start to do a crabbing movement inside to then create that space. So we practice being right in the boards coming in. And here he's practicing being, doing a quick spin because he's beaten the player with this crabbing motion. And then he's doing the quick little wrist shot trying to get over the top shoulder. So again, we've just added more and more variations as we keep going through. Here's some more examples of it. And what you're gonna notice here is how we've added that key skill of the spin again. So we've just got our passing again, simple little movement running in, getting that little one touch pass going, getting that position. Now we've got a little dump ball again. So similar to what we're doing before the goalie, but now seeing how we've incorporated the spin at the start of the drill again getting that key skill working, little step inside, little flick inside, but this time the ball's gone back. So again, we're creating that variety and that flexibility for the players to be creative while understanding why certain things work in certain situations and trying to get other players to understand the cues so then they can make things happen in the game when they need to happen. And at this stage, we still haven't added any defenders. So all their decision making is being based on what they decide they want to do rather than an outside influence. You'll notice if you look at the clips there, you would have seen myself walking around as well, chatting to each player after it, talking about little things that we'd like to see or things about how we could do something better or why they made a particular decision too. And again, they're having to constantly think. So sometimes you'll see them stutter or stop because they're having to constantly think about what they're doing and why they're doing something. Now, I'm gonna just quickly pause on that one because what we've done now is we've added, as we spoke about previously, we've now added an extra player. So now it's no longer a two on none, it is now a three on none so that we're getting people in other positions. So we're now starting with a player deep in the corner. So you'll see a person with a yellow shirt right down in the very far corner. And now every time we do the drill, they're gonna be the player that comes up on that 45 pass. Whereas the player who starts with the ball and passes it will always be there for the 90. So now we're getting players into key positions so that when other things happen, they then have to learn how to rotate or change position. So here you'll notice the player from the corner will move up to that square position and there we're able to get that next pass across. Player goes in the corner again and now we're again doing the three on none. We start with the spin, moves across. It's a sort of a dump back ball, then the square ball across for that player. Whoop, ball got in the way, keep going. Dumping it square. Dumping it square again. So we're getting these little bit of options where it's now three players having to work together. Players having to read cues. Now here's a, a nice little one because this showed now once the variation of the second sort of arc happening, how everyone had to then rotate, not just one person. So here is the ball comes through. We've done our little key skill spin. We've run square. So that means our player who started with the ball has to recognize it's going to be a square pass in. They pick it up. We've already got a player down towards the back line. So the player now with the ball, as they run towards the back line, the player in the corner now has to recognize they have to rotate and get out and they're going to be the person in line with the post on the 45 the person already in the circle is now realizing they have to drop out and they have to be there for that 90 back ball so we then have this rotation that's now happened to create that so we'll watch that one from the start again yeah but again we just start to encourage 
all these sort of cues and decisions making and we start to get the rotations and everything happening. All right, now we've moved to a stage where we've thrown in a defender. So now it's become a two-on-one situation here for this one. We've get, got rid of the person in the corner, it's just two-on-one. And now the attackers are gonna to need to make their decisions and the right decisions to be effective to maintain possession and score a goal. And they're gonna to have to do it based on the defender. So the defender again is gonna to try to focus on forcing the attackers into a situation that they do what the defender wants. So the defender is not simply reacting and chasing, but they're being proactive and forcing them to make certain decisions. So now we've got that outside influence affecting what we're doing. So they could be using any of these variations and they have to get that immediate feedback. Was this the right time to do that square ball? Was this the right time to run an angle? We'll start to see more errors at the start because of that extra pressure of a defender. And as we get more and more used to it, we'll get less and less errors. Now, this one here is the same where we've added a defender, but this is actually the three on one now. So what we've got is we've still got that um, defender on top of the circle, the attacker on top of the circle, the attacker passing the ball and starting the drill, but we've thrown that attacker again starting in the corner. So now it's become a three on one and the players now have to learn to move based on the cues, and they're also going to have to make those decisions based on what the defender is allowing to happen. So again, we're starting to develop a lot more of that decision-making and the cohesiveness and the ability for players to start reading each other as we build it up. Now, this one again is 3v1, again, down that right-hand side, but just from a different angle. Now, you would notice with a lot of these things, there are lots of players all over the court. I don't have a big issue with having players near the drills and that, what it does is it forces the players in the drill often to identify which are the players that they're working with. So it makes it a little bit harder for them and they have to work harder to recognize spaces and players, recognize who's in the drill and not in the drill. So I don't have a huge issue with having some players around the drill as well, as long as they're not directly in the middle of it, sort of impacting on it or affecting it. So just from this reverse angle, we again got the three on one. You can see the player from the corner. You can see we've got that 90 back ball and that. And then there was the opportunity to provide some feedback to the player who had the ball and sort of ask them the question about when they'd run this ball down into the corner, why did they choose to give a, a dump ball back? Because they'd actually eliminated the defender here. So this is where we'd sort of been saying, well, if you've eliminated this defender, why aren't we looking instead for maybe a little gap between the goalkeeper and the defender? And why isn't the player on the top recognizing that as well? So this is where we can start to get into quick little bits of feedback and asking them about their positioning and their choices without stopping the whole drill and with other players still being able to continue. All right, here we have a, a right side attacking 3v1, 3v1 drill again, but we've started with the third attacker in a different position. So we're still encouraging the attacking players to get into those similar positions in the circle, trying to run that back line, trying to have that 90 back ball, trying to have that little 45 back ball, that sort of thing. But rather than now having the attacker starting, the third attacker starting in the corner, the far corner, they're actually starting in line with where the ball starts. 
So you should be able to see it once the drill happens, but you'll notice that we've just shifted where that attacking player has started. And it's important sometimes just to start in different positions. So players have to learn then to get into the positions we eventually want them. So we're up near the halfway this time, and now they have to start to move in. We've in fact used them to start with here. We're doing a few passes back and forth, and now the movement's gone, and then we move into those sort of key positions. So we had the option here that when the ball was passed to the player on top of the circle, they didn't have to do something straight away. They could say, give the ball back. And then we've had the option to move the ball square, readjust the play in the middle of the circle. And then once they get the ball here, it's then about the three players trying to get to those key positions we talked about. And there they are, that 90 back ball, that little 45 ball in, and the players being able to get there from different positions. So just simply changing where one player may start at the beginning of the drill can actually then provide that mental thought process as well of getting to those eventual positions. All right. And as you can see, as we keep progressing, the decisions start to get faster and faster. And we, we continue to always have options with everything we're doing. It's just a matter of understanding we have an option and choosing the right option. All right, so now what we're going to move to is we're going to look at attacking from the halfway line. So the two most common areas on the court where we generally ha will have that free push or that stationary free is generally going to be from around the top of our circle or it's going to be from the halfway line. Now even when players uh, and teams tend to get free hits near the attacking edge of the circle, often the ball will get passed directly back to the halfway line to a teammate. So even those frees near the edge of the circle generally end up being setups from the half line. So it's really important for a team to be able to structure movements from around that halfway line because a lot of play is initiated from that, that part of the court. What we're going to try to do now is we're going to try to build the previous two concepts of that left side and that right side. And then we try to take it into how can we have both being able to be flowed between when we start on the halfway. So let's have a look at now how this looks and one way of doing this. So the first thing is we've got our half court attack drill here where player A is gonna pass the ball to B and notice B is standing really close. So they're in the middle of the court, not right out near the boards. B will then pass it back to A and then B runs all the way out to that outside of the court. What will then happen is eventually C is going to get the ball in the far corner and put the ball across. So it's going to look like this if we play it. Ball goes across, ball comes back, ball goes down, moves across. So you can see how we've started in a, a right-hand side attacking setup, but then we've been able to develop it into one of those concepts we were looking at the left-hand side. Now, here's, here's an example of what it looks like um, in real life with the video. It can be complicated at the start. And this is again, a learning process from the players, but it's good because it keeps them thinking. And we need our players thinking constantly about where they need to be and why they're doing things. So they've started with a pass to the top and the pass has come back. It's gone into the middle, gone across, the defender shifted all the way out. So now they're really wide to give that ball into the corner. And then they're giving that ball across for that nice little tap in. Something slightly different happening here. Notice the defender took a little bit longer to come out wider. So again, there was that thought process thinking about what they needed to do. And we'll talk about it 
with this next one now, but here's a variation to it, what we've added. And we'll explain how we wanted players to then work this out based on cues. But we explain essentially to the players that sometimes a gap opens up in the middle of the court and we want to take advantage of this. So sometimes we don't want to attack down the right or the left. We want to take advantage of that big gap they've opened up through the center. So in this example, the defender now, rather than shifting all the way out to the boards, sort of maintains a central position because they've identified a gap in the middle of the defense. They line themselves up with that gap. And then when they receive the ball back, they pass the ball straight through the middle of the circle to the player in the circle. It's important the player in the middle then reads the cue. And we'll talk about that cue in a little bit more detail in a second. So you'll see the defenders adjusted in the middle, but they haven't gone out wide. They've just stayed in the middle. And then we've gone in for that little deflection there. So let's have a, a little bit of uh, more detailed, just look at that one. So we'll just go back to, all right. So if we look at the drill here now, what we've got is we've got the player with the ball and they pass it in and then they're gonna pass it back out. So we're going to see this ball get passed. One pass back out here. So as that ball goes back out and the ball goes into this middle player, rather than them running all the way out wide, they've identified that there's perhaps a gap through here to be able to give a pass. So then what they're going to do is after they've given that ball back, they've adjusted their positioning slightly to open that gap up. This player here after passing the ball back would have normally run all the way down to this corner. But as they've started to move down, they've now noticed that this defender in the middle hasn't gone all the way to the boards. Now, because they've recognized they haven't gone to the boards, they go, well, there's no point going into that corner because I'm not going to get it. By them being in the middle, that tells them the ball's going to come through the middle. So this player then does a run where they start to run a bit deeper. And then what they're going to do is the moment they see this pass about to happen, they're going to run through wherever the gap is that they can see. If they run sideways, sometimes they won't find the gap. So it's much easier to find the gap if you go deeper and you can look back towards the ball carrier and you can see where this gap is you need to line yourself up to run through. So the cue for this player to understand they're going to do a down to the back line and run forwards for a deflection is they notice where this person's positioning is. We spoke earlier that if this player turns and they turn their back on the play, then they're not going to see what's happening here and they're not going to read the cue and they're not going to know that they have to do this little looping movement to come in for a deflection. They're just going to turn around and run to the corner and it'll be too late before they recognize that this player isn't in the corner. So by them turning, but keeping their eyes facing towards the ball, they can read the cue and see what's happening. All right, let's go back to our little video slideshow. All right, so I'm just gonna go back to that one again. So now you can just have a, a little bit of a a look at it um, again after we've just spoken about that. Now here they've turned their back on the play after the pass, they can't see the cue. So that's now a key moment for us after this to have a real quick chat about feedback and say, hey, just make sure you're turning so you can keep your eye on the ball and you can read the cue. Now, 
it's the same drill again from the halfway, but we've now added a fourth player. So we've added an extra player and we've added a player in the corner. So we've still got our two players up near the halfway line, our player near the top of the circle, but now we've put a player in the corner straight away. So it's now four on none. So what it now means is the ball can go to the player in the corner much quicker because we're not waiting for someone to get there. And we've now got, again, we've brought an extra player into the circle. So it's not just the two players in the circle. So we're trying to then encourage that right defender to be coming forwards and be a, a fourth attacker here. Our defender is sort of hovering in the middle. Now they've decided to get wide. That should then cue to everyone that's gonna go down the corner. So again, we're looking for those little cues. All right, now what I want you to do is here, this is four and none again, but now we've added another variation. See if you can work it out. It's, it should be hopefully very obvious, but let's see if we can work out the main variation we've added here, especially with our two forward players. All right, so hopefully that was pretty obvious. We've now added a rotation between the two forwards. So the first forward passes it back and the guy in the corner runs up and the other guy runs into the corner. So now we've started to add the idea of rotating and changing position and players having to still cue in with where the defender is. So on that last one, for example, there, even though we had a player who had then run down into the corner, our defender here has stayed in the middle of the court. So our player over on the left-hand side, he's got the ball now. As he passes it back, he's really focused on looking and he can see that the player who's receiving is in the middle. So now he's doing his movement for the center deflection. And the GoPro got hit. All right. So let's have a, another look. Again, the players are making decisions on the options that they're gonna take when they have the ball here. So we should start to see a lot more sort of flexibility happening with things and a lot more variation. So we've had another rotation there. This player is just passing the ball back. It's going in, it looks like it's going to the corner and we're trying to work out it's going. No, nope, it's come back out of the corner. Can't see it yet. Now we're starting again, All right? So. It keeps flowing back and forth based on decisions. We have a rotation again. They're still short. And the, the idea is each one's making a decision. He's decided to attack down the right. So now we've gone to that attacking setup. Even though we aren't really focusing hugely on it, we've got a half court drill. But now we've actually gone into that right hand side drill we were doing where he's running the back line, got a player backwards, got a player on that 45 and it started to develop into our now half court attacking drill. Again, at the moment, we haven't got any defenders, so they're able to make decisions without a lot of pressure. They can make any decision they want and it's essentially gonna work because there's no one to really stop it. All right, now we've, we've stepped up. So now we've turned it into a four on one drill. So you can see the nice orange shirt. That's our defender starting behind the guy in the middle. And we're going to have the drill where there's now a defender involved. So now decision making is gonna have direct feedback because if they make the wrong decision, the defender's gonna get it. Again, we want our defender to be focusing on forcing them into options they want. We've got the rotation again, they've decided to do. A little bit of a stutter as they think about, should I be going, should I not be going? The defender went wide, so the corner was on. He's pulled it out because he didn't think he was gonna be able to give it. And we're going back to the very first drill we ended up doing with that little pattern there. So everything starts being encompassed into one. So we're getting a lot more movement, a lot more decisions having to be made, a lot more focus having to be done. 
and we can start to see everything becoming much more flowing and get match like. Same again, but now what we've done is we've turned it into a four and two drill. So now we make it harder for the attackers. So now we've got two defenders, one behind the player on the left and one in the center of the circle. So the players having to start to try to read the cues, you know, is that pass able to be made down the boards? If it is, I should have a player there. If the defender's more central, we're gonna to have to look for the gaps between the defenders for that central pass. When I make my little rotation on my lead, am I doing it at the right moment? Is my right defender coming forward and we're creating that extra player, especially in the circle and attack? Four on two again here. So we've got the two blue defenders. We've got a yellow player off screen who's come in for the rotation. This time decided to attack down the right, couldn't get around him, dumped the ball, decided to run a further arc. So you can just see how there's so much more movement happening as players start to have to put it into practice under pressure, especially when you develop it in steps which make it easier for them to then develop that. This is a uh, four on two again, slightly different angle. You can start to see the defenders having to communicate a lot more because there's only two of them trying to make sure they're covering the, the key areas because they don't want the ball really coming through the middle. Players having to recognize where they need to be based on where the ball is and what's possible. So do we need someone in that corner? Do we not need someone in that corner? So now we've increased the variables and the decision-making a bit more here. So now we've actually made this into a five on two drill. So we've added an extra attacker who you can now see standing roughly where the penalty spot is in the middle in the white shirt. So now we have to make sure that we're getting into good quality positions as a group of five players rather than a group of two players or three players, not getting in each other's way, working together, reading the cues. So there are now more options that can be made and more positioning that needs to be decided. But again, we haven't just jumped into doing a five on five game. We've built it up to a stage where now we actually end up having quality with players knowing options, when to do things, good decision-making. And after it, they can make good quality feedback comments based on what worked and what didn't work because they know why something should have happened. So we also then start to get players recognizing rotations and when to rotate. And we should be starting to see some, some, some good sort of plays, some things where we go, that was really well constructed under pressure. Five on two again, from a uh, slightly different um, perspective. So the two white shirts are the defenders, the five green shirts are our attackers. Again, players trying to get in those positions, trying to work on those main concepts of how we attack down the right and the left, looking for gaps through the middle, trying to rotate, trying to read cues. Now we've upped it again. So now we've turned it into a five on three. So now we have three defenders and five attackers. So now more options are gonna be taken away and we have to again, start to work out what are the best options as we go. So we're progressing more and more towards that 100% match situation but making sure that everything's effective and players have had a chance to 
understand the concepts and put them into practice. All right, so let's move away from the half court staff. We'll move away from the left side, the right side. Now let's talk about working out um, what we should be doing at training comes down to analyzing the game and finding the areas that have the biggest impact on the results of matches. So when I sat down and I analyzed all the men's goals, field goals that were scored, at the 2020 Euros, the 2018 Euros, the 2016 Euros, the 2018 World Cup, 2015 World Cup. So we're talking about 146 matches over 1,100 field uh, goals. It was 25% of all the goals that were scored happened directly from a turnover or breakaway situation. So it's a fairly large component. So it's an area that we need to make sure we're successful in is handling breakaway situations where we can then turn them into goals. So when a team loses possession of the ball, that's often when they're weakest defensively. So we need to get into the process of being able to have a transition from attack to defense, but also from defense to attack. Here's a, a quick little three on two drill. So basically the two defenders are passing the ball between themselves and they make a pass and there's three attackers in the halfway and they receive the pass. So it's going to look Keep going, just explaining the drill. The blue players work together. Yep. Try and score. The red players try to prevent them. And for it to end, the red players need to make at least one pass between them for it to be over. As a bit of an animation, this is, whoops, we'll go back to it. This is what it looks like. So passed across, passed up, and then we get our players trying to move into a situation. Again, it's about incorporating our left side attack, our right side attack, our half court attack, and trying to get players to be able to do that straight away from a breakaway situation. So here's an example in practice, no goalie here, but that's fine. So you can see how they've developed, then they went from the breakaway and they were able to go straight into a left side attacking play. So we've gone here and they've decided to attack down the right. So then they're building up to set up a proper right side attack play. So again, it's about them then flowing even further into the concepts that we know work well, even from the quick breakaway situation. Little mistakes because of pressure. And again, the more they get used to the pressure, the fewer the mistakes they make. All right, so again, but just from a slightly different angle. So defenders pass it, turnover, quick breakaway situation. We want to encourage the speed and then being able to do it as quick as possible because that's the whole idea of a breakaway is being able to get into these positions and execute the concepts that work very quickly before the defense can structure themselves. Now we can do a slight variation on that. So now we can make it more like a breakaway situation that happens from the halfway line. So our defenders and our attackers both start on the halfway line. And it starts when the defender gives a quick little square ball to the attacker. And now it's three on two again, but our defenders are having to chase back to defend rather than starting in front of the play. And again, it's about our attackers being able to quickly structure themselves to create a good goal scoring opportunity without taking too much time. And again, relying on those concepts that we've gone through previously about how we want to attack down the left, how we want to attack down the right, how we want to attack on the half court. So here's one quick little animation example. So we're just moving really quick. They've decided to attack down the right. 
and we look for those little movements. Here's a, a video of it in practice, what it looks like. So again, it's about being able to execute it at pace and players being able to read the cues and move quickly. And here's some just from a different angle. All right, just a couple of quick drills for some goalies in terms of off the court. The, the ability for the goalkeeper to effectively and efficiently move quickly and can make all the difference when they save a shot on goal. And goalkeepers don't spend enough time on this very important area. We need our goalkeepers to be able to coordinate different parts of their body in different ways at different times and to be balanced while they're doing it and also to be able to do things while they're unbalanced. So here's a couple of examples that goalkeepers can do to work on their agility, their footwork and their hand-eye coordination. Very simple little drills, but provide the ability for them to have different parts of their bodies moving at different times and coordinate. So it can be used for warm-ups, can be used at other points just during training, or it can be used in a home program. So again, here's just one which is more about the balance. So we try to create a situation where they're a bit unbalanced and having to coordinate their hands while maintaining their balance. All right, let's talk about speed of execution. So speed of execution is really critical. The, the player who can do something with a minimum amount of time generally will find success. If it takes someone too long to do something, then a gap closes, they get tackled, the opportunity has gone. So I want to try to create situations at training and in drills where we can make it so that they're executing things under pressure really fast. So here's a few examples of how we can have some drills which really put the pressure on in terms of time and speed to do things. So this is a deflection one. There's four players about to pass the balls to one player doing deflections. So they don't have a lot of time to sit there and think about what's going on. They've got to quickly be going between each go and try to get their speed of execution as high as possible. Again, it can be done with a goalkeeper in. This next one's about getting a quick shot away while on the move um, and keeping the ball low. And also for the goalkeepers to have a situation where they've got to save everything because even if it's going to miss the goal, the shots here tend to be kept in because of the positioning of the boards. So it's about getting the goalkeepers moving and moving quick, getting the players being able to do this run and shot fast, but also having to keep it on the ground for this one. So it's this sort of rapid fire sort of drills. Next one is very similar. However, what happened is this is more about that left corner where the ball goes in the left corner and comes across. So it's about the person in the left corner getting the ball out of the left corner really quick. So it's the same person who stays there for the whole thing and the same person passing it into the left corner. So they have to do it really fast without having a break and they can't be pausing between each go. And then the goalkeeper's footwork in terms of moving across to make a save and then getting back really quick.
All right. Now we're going to have a quick look at, so we talked about taking a concept and putting the concept into a training drill and doing it through the progressive steps to then be able to make it something that could be really successful in match situations. This one here is looking at taking a key skill and then turning that key skill into something that we can then achieve success at in a match. Often with key skills though, if we just play matches, we don't get enough opportunity to practice them because they don't happen enough for the repetition that's required. So we need to create a training situation where we allow players large repetition to improve their technique and timing and consistency. So we're gonna take the example of the key skill of the takeover tackle. So here's what the takeover tackle looks like. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn it into a drill. So the first step we have here is a setup with the opportunity for them to start to practice it with no real pressure. <clears throat> We've incorporated a separate skill at the end as well. So for example, the defender executes the takeover tackle and then runs into the circle and they make a particular shot. So they might make a wrist shot over the goalkeeper's shoulder. So then the goalkeeper is also focusing on making a particular save with their right hand glove. So the goalkeeper is making a save with their right hand glove. The player is making a wrist shot over the shoulder. At the very start of the drill, they're performing the takeover tackle. So as the player gets better, we get the ball carrier then to move the ball faster and make it more difficult for the defender to make that tackle. So less opportunities for them to make the tackle because they might keep the ball between their feet for longer and only show it outside their feet a few times. So we just basically allow that basic process to get used to when we make the actual tackles and getting used to then consistently getting the body in the right position so that as we progress, the skill gets better and better. So again, here it is just from a slightly different angle. So we have the player just moving the ball the takeover tackle coming in and having to learn to when to time it. They get more and more practice because of the repetitions they get at it. There's not a lot of pressure on them. Then what we do is we can then turn it into, for example, the next step could be once they've made that tackle, that it becomes a one-on-one. -on -one. So as they're running towards the circle, the person who's lost the ball now has to chase them and it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. Then we can move into a two-on-one. So here, for example, is a situation where it's a two on one. So we're going to have a player making the takeover tackle and then the two attackers attack with the person who's lost the ball now having to defend. So we take the ball, it's now a two on one, quick little breakaway, trying then to make that score. We've got a goalkeeper in the net. If we wanted to, we could also make this where we actually have a second goalkeeper positioned in the circle and it actually ends up being two goalkeepers they have to beat as well as the defender running back. So using a second goalkeeper as an additional defender in the circle is also a great way of putting pressure on attackers to come up with the right options. We could then turn this into a, a three on two. So for example, we could have a attacker and a defender positioned in the circle and then when the two attackers take the ball, they've then got the additional attacker to use in the circle and the defender running back has a defender in the circle to work with as well. So again, we then progressing it up in those numbers as we were with the other stuff. <clears throat> All right, just some little um, things that are to consider and would be in your mind when you are designing your training activities. Think about whether you want the players to use the boards or not. So if you want them to use the boards, have a position on the field where they can. If you don't want them to use the boards, put it more central so that they can't use the boards. Do we want the players to have access to the goals to shoot at or are we not gonna use the goals? Are we gonna take that away so that the goals aren't a major part of it? Can we add a particular skill? Can we add a spin or a dump pass, a wrist shot? Can we add one of these key skills somewhere into it so that we're further practicing it? How are we gonna progressively increase the decision-making? How are we going to make it suppliers have to make more decisions and work out what decision is correct and what is accurate? How are we going to make our drill to get to that match-like decision-making side? How are we going to increase the challenge, the speed, the pressure and progress the activity? Are we going to add extra defenders, extra attackers? Are we going to have time limits? 
are we going to increase the size or the space that we use? As it says there as well, how are we going to use our time, space, numbers, opposition, the court position to get the results we want? Are we going to use a particular part of the court? Are we going to stack the attackers so they've got hardly any defense, so it's easier for them? Or are we going to make it really hard by making the numbers even? And then can we incorporate a pre-start phase? I'm going to show you an example of that one right now. So what I mean by a pre-start phase is we had the half court drill we showed earlier. What I've done here is we're doing a little pre-start phase where they have to do a passing combination, which then involves passing the ball back out and resetting and then doing the drill. So they get used to a situation where they've tried to do something, it doesn't work. They then pass the ball back out and everyone repositions and resets. So we just have a couple of passes here and we've got this movement. So the drill hasn't actually really started yet. We've run, we've passed out, but now we're gonna reset. So we pass it back out and now everyone readjusts as if we've had to reset during the game. And now the drill is actually live in terms of the decision-making of what happens and where the ball goes. So you can incorporate that pre-start phase as well to get resets and recycling of the ball happening as well. All right, going to show you a couple of quick little games that you might want to look at. So the first one is a possession game where it occurs from the top of the circle to the top of the circle, so that blue area, and we have three teams of two players. So here we've got a blue team, we've got a yellow team, and we've got a red team. Now, one team starts with a ball. So here the red team started with a ball. It is actually a four on two possession game. So the way it works is red might work with blue. So red and blue are a team of four, yellow's the defending team. So red and blue are trying to hold possession and they're trying to either do it for whatever you set. It might be for 60 seconds, it might be for five passes to get a point, whatever you decide. Now, if say red has the ball and they pass it and yellow gets it. So red loses possession and yellow gets it. Red team now becomes the defenders and now the attacking team is the yellow and the blue. So there's always two teams that are attacking and one team defending. And if the one team loses possession, they now become the defending team. Very similar to the last one, but this time it's just two on, um, sorry, We've got our um, two yellow, two red, two blue, but now what we do is we add an extra player. So now it's actually three on each team, which means it's a six on three in that area now for possession. The next one is similar to the last one, but we're only doing it now between the boards in the middle of the court. So we've made the area much skinnier and there's gonna be a lot more use of the boards. So again, it's two on, to each team, which means it's going to be four on two in terms of the attacking. So it might be yellow and blue together with red defending. Another drill is this time we're going to use um, a longer court. So it's gonna go from end to end and it's only half the width of the court though. We're going to have three attackers on one team and three attackers in the other team. So it's three on three, but we add a goalkeeper to each end as well. And to score, they've got to run the ball over the baseline or pass it over the baseline. And they can do that from anywhere. So the goalkeeper has got a, a bigger area to cover, but it's all on the ground. We can then play one which is a full court game, but we have two goals in the middle of the court rather than the ends of the court. And we don't use the circle area. So we've got a blue goal and a red goal. We have three blue players versus three red players, and we have goalies. And now the blue team is trying to score in the blue goal. I'm sorry, the blue team is trying to score in the red goal, and the red team's trying to score in the blue goal. So you've got to go around the goals rather than towards them. Then what we can do is we can do what we call a rollover game. So we're only going to play in half the court area. We're going to have a team of three blue a team of three yellow. And then this is the bit where the rollover happens. You've got the blue versus the yellow, but on the halfway line, you've got two gates. And in those gates, you've got three red players. So the blue team attacks and tries to score against the goalie. If the blue team scores, the red team comes in and now they're the attacking team. 
The yellow team's defending and they just keep defending until they get possession of the ball and can pass it through one of the gates to the red player. So if they get the ball and they pass it through the gate to the red player, the yellow now gets out and the blue team's now defending and the team they pass to, the red team, comes in and attacks. So it's a constant rollover. But to get out of defence, you need to pass it to the team that's not in the game through one of those gates. Can do a similar sort of thing with a two-on-two -two rollover game where it's much, much closer to the circle. So you have two on the blue, two on the yellow with your goalie. You've got your ball. But we've got two gates which are a little bit closer and our red players are there waiting. So for yellow to get out of defending, they've got to pass the ball through the gate to the red player. For the blue to get out of attacking, they need to score a goal. And then the red team comes in and attack. Now with this one, the whole game's played inside the circle. So the blue and the yellow team shouldn't be leaving the circle. Now we can do the same thing, but this time with three on each team rather than with two. So again, we have our gates, but we've now got limited area because it's now three on three rather than two on two. We can do a half court game involving four versus four, but the way it works here is our blue team is attacking, our yellow team is defending. If the blue team scores, they go back to the halfway and start again and they keep attacking. For the yellow team to get out of defending, they have to get possession of the ball and run it across the halfway line. They run it across the halfway line, they're now the attacking team and the blue team is defending. So by running across the halfway line, you get to change from being defenders to attackers. Now we can also then do a full court game where we have five attackers and we have three defenders with goalkeepers. So the blue team here has got five players and they're attacking. The red team's got three defenders. Now there's two other red players sitting on the sideline. If red get possession of the ball and they become the attacking team, those two players step on. So then red as an attacking team would have five players and blue would have to drop two off and blue then has three defenders. So the attackers always get five players and the defenders always get three. All right, wrapping up. Um, just some of my top tips for when you're doing your training sessions and planning them, make sure you have a match focus. Make sure you base the concepts and the area of the court and the skills on what you wanna see in matches. So try not to be passing the ball on angles or in areas in your training sessions where you don't wanna see it in a game because what you do on the training court will then be recreated in the matches. We need to make sure we progress and promote decision-making and creativity. Our players need to understand why, how, and when things are happening and why they're doing them. Need to make sure that we incorporate key individual skills such as the spin and things like we talked about. There's a learning phase at the start of each drill and activity or game. So don't expect perfection. Give the opportunity at the very start for them just to learn how the drill or game works. Make use of the time available and provide specific feedback. So don't have too many times where you're just stopping everything and chatting, but try to have the things going on continually so you're making the most of your time on the court. A few more tips. You can use drills as rest breaks. So if you've got a lot of people running around getting tired, you can suddenly do a drill as a rest for five minutes where it might just be a player running into the circle and shooting one at a time. Try to have water bottles near the court so players can go get a drink whenever they want without having to stop for a five or 10 minute drink break. Set up activities when players are collecting the balls for you. So rather than them collecting the balls, then resetting up an activity, try to have them collect the balls as you're setting the activity up. Have enough hockey balls so that drills don't have to stop because you run out of balls. So you can stop the drill when you want, but you don't want to have to keep stopping because you run out of hockey balls and they have to keep recollecting them. Try to give feedback to individuals and small groups without stopping the whole training or the whole drill. So really make it very individual towards players and small groups. And correct with your presence, your positioning and your voice. So for example, if I want a player to stay wide, I might go stand somewhere so they have to run around me. 
or I might stand in a particular position right near a player and be talking to them as they're doing the drill to try to keep the correction going. Um, if you're looking for any more resources or anything, have a look at um, the YouTube channel. What I'll do is this presentation, I will upload it to the YouTube channel as well, similar to the, the last one on the key skills. Now, if there are any, any sort of questions, please let me know. I noticed there was a couple of um, things typed in into the chat. So there's one about how much time would you spend in each drill in a training session? I try not to spend a huge amount of time on each drill because we want players to be able to maintain their focus and be able to continually keep that thinking going. So generally drills would only go for about five or six minutes before there was some sort of variation or change happening. Uh, that seems like the only uh, question that was in the chat. Has anyone got any, any questions from what we've spoken about or they'd like to ask about or anything they'd like to say? Please, please let us know. Otherwise, feel free to, to email me um, or get in contact with me um, and we can, we can talk about um, things off here as well. Hey, Steve. Hi, how are you going? Yeah, good evening from Jakarta. Thank you very much for your great presentation today. I'm just asking about, you know, as you know, the sideboard is a, from my, from my understanding is a, can be treated as a seventh player on the pitch. Yes. So, as you know, that it's very difficult for us in Indonesia uh, to, to use the sideboard. Can you go, uh, give me, a, give us a, a advice to how to train our player to use the sideboard? Thank you very much. So I would say that when I talk to my players about using the sideboards, I say to them, if you can make a direct pass, make a direct pass, don't use the boards. However, if you need to eliminate a player, then that's when you would use the boards. And when you use the boards, you should only ever be using the boards to eliminate one defender. So if you try to eliminate two defenders with a pass off the boards, by the time the ball bounces back in, the second defender will have it. And when you try to use the boards to eliminate a defender, always look at passing the ball so that the ball hits the boards directly beside them. By hitting the ball directly beside them, the ball's the furthest distance it can be away from that player. So it's much harder for that player then to intercept or, or take that pass away. Um, and then I would set up some drills involving where they, for example, you would start. So similar to how we had a drill, we had the spin. I might start a drill where the player starts with the ball and there's maybe an obstacle in front of them or something. And the very first pass to start the drill is always a pass off the boards. So then we start to get that angle and that, that idea created. Um, the one where we had the right side, I, I might bring up the yeah. whiteboard to show this one to make it a little bit easier. The, let me just bring it up. So with the, the one we had down the right hand side, for example, where we had a player starting here with the ball and we had a player here and we were doing this sort of pass, what you could simply do with that is you could actually throw a defender in here at the very start. And then the player who has the ball has to pass the ball off the boards every time to get to this player to begin with. So we can do little things like that too, where the key skill for us at the very start isn't the, say a spin or something like that, but it might be the pass off the boards and just getting them used to when to use it and how to use it. Yeah, Does that thank sort you very of much. answer the question or make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you, thank you very yeah. much. Excellent. And what is the name of the program that you use? Instead of um, the whiteboard, there's a movable. So it's on it's on the iPad and it's just called whiteboard. Um, it's a, a symbol which is a W symbol. If you look at for the for the app, but it's just called whiteboard. Yeah, the the, the other one. I, oh, I the, remember the, you the one with the video. The first yeah, yeah, the second one. The uh, movable. One the video that that one's called yeah. Coach's Eye. Okay, okay. So, so I can. If you do a search for Coach's Eye, it looks like a little little camera. Um, yep. Let me see if I can. Make it a bit easier for you. I'll bring it up. All right, so it's just the one up at the top middle of the screen called Coach's Eye, um, yeah. which looks like a little camera. That's the that's the the video one, where you can yeah. come in and you can you can draw things and you can play your videos 
and all that sort of stuff. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Any any other questions at the moment from anyone, or if not, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. All right. Uh, all right, we've got just one quick one here, which is just asking about how to overcome with a team that plays very defensive. So if a team's playing very defensive, they're going to have a certain area of the court that they're going to be playing within. So we may not be doing a lot of um, elimination of their front line from our half of the court. So a lot of it's going to be revolving around that attacking half of the court and being closer to them to start with. So then it's going to be about trying to get the defenders in a positions where they have to take a step one way or the other or create a gap. And teams that tend to play defensive tend to have a lot less space because they're a lot further towards their own goal. So it then means the execution of the skills, the one touch passing and the real quick movements and the spins and turns and stuff in tighter spaces need to be incorporated a lot more if you're gonna have a team which wants to be that lot more defensive. If they're gonna be defensive one-on-one -on -one type situation, then it's about that real quick elimination of that one player then to create the extra numbers and two on ones. Um, but we'll, we'll have some further webinars on some things to do with that as well. All right, we'll leave it there then. Thank you very much again and enjoy your evening or day depending on where you are. And if there's anything else, just send me an email. Thank you.